Welcome back to my studio. Anne Mitchell here. Genesis Creations is my business and playing in fabric designing is my fun. Okay, we had a wild journey yesterday going through a whole lot of basic skills, but uh, I think it's probably a good idea to remind you of what those basics are. Yep. Liquid Radiance is a very different sort of product. It's not a dye, but it penetrates the fibre in the same way as a dye does. It's actually by formulation a paint and a paint will form a skin. So knowing the rules and how to use liquid radiance is the key. So go back to session one if you haven't seen that one yet. But today I'm going to take you through a whole lot more things that we can do to really get some exciting stuff happening with liquid radiance. We looked at the fact that liquid radiance does come in these tiny little bottles and we do dilute it with water. It was one quarter, three quarters yesterday, one quarter concentrate, three quarters water, just because that's my favorite mix. But of course you can mix it to whatever you want. Today, we're going to bring in the big guns and take it down a whole lot further with water because you do not want to work on sample pieces forever, do you? The sample pieces that we're going to do, to do today involve a product, another one of my brain children, called Water Soluble Resist. And that's going to get designing happening within your colours. We're going to play with marbles, we're going to play with poles, we're going to play with grids, all sorts of fun things, just to get different ways of patterning into your fabric. First up though, I think it's really important that I let you know that we don't actually name our colours. And you'll see that on three of them we've put a spot. Now by just not naming our colours, and I figure everybody can tell yellow from red from blue, yeah? Um, we save you $2 a bottle in production costs. It is that crazy. Okay, so on the purple one you'll find a purple spot, on the cyan one, that's the lighter blue, you'll find a cyan spot. If that matches, if the spot matches the colour on the label, you've got cyan because cyan's a printer's colour. And if it's a darker blue, it's blue or thalo blue by pigmentation colour. Those three are really tricky to tell apart and that's why I put the spots on them. You write the names on them and you've got a big saving. Okay, so we know that we're going to take off those flat caps, pop on the dispenser caps and we're ready for action. These are a more expensive cap than the flat caps. These dispenser caps don't wear out. So why spend all that extra money in the production costs? Hey, I've got Scottish blood. Yep, we want these to be as economical as we possibly can for you. So today I'm actually going to be mixing down my colours eventually using the concentrates, all with their dispenser caps on. But we also know that when we've diluted them, they're all going to have their stockings on, so we do know the difference between the diluted ones and the concentrates. Okay, where do we start with all this fun? Mm, I think we might start with a water soluble. Now, I've got a confession to make. I'm an addicted silk painter, and if you don't want to get hooked on anything, don't start silk painting ever. But I did. But I didn't like the steaming and the rinsing and all the fixatives and all that messing around con con concerning dyes. So with our paint chemist, I developed a product called Water Soluble Resist, which is all non-toxic in conjunction with the uh, principles that we use in all our products. What this one will do for your silk painting is give you the look of a clear gutta and we'll be exploring that in our third session of this innovative technology series. Um, but what it does when you're working on your fabric, well you've got to see it to believe it really, but by applying the colour to the top, the, the colour through two layers and then the water soluble to the top layer. You actually get three different types of designing happening through your layers. Hmm. So let's see how that one is done. 
I'll just be doing quick samples again. There's another example. That one. Then we're going to have a little game with marbles and see where you can travel with that. Uh, we looked at one colour colouring in our first session. The socks we're going to do today. My shirt, perfect example of that. I can't wear red. Blows me up like a Christmas tree. But gee, pop a bit of colour on it and no worries. We're going to see what happens when we poke things into holes. Not holes in your socks. Holes in gadgetry. And um, then play with the big stuff. Water soluble resist. That was bad. I'm just going to do a quick sample with our water soluble resist. I'm going to take a piece of fabric and I could either, and it is wet and squeezed out well, just as you saw in our first session. And instead of doing uh, a second piece, just so it's nice and quick for you to see what happens, I'm going to fold it so I actually have two layers. But by doing a folded piece of fabric like this, you can actually get symmetrical patterns when you open up to your inner layers. Okay, I am going to start off with our colours from our first session, the one quarter, three quarters mixes, and just, well, we might do some tulips today. I can't draw, but I can do eggs. Now they could be tulips, they could be roses. We might make a couple into roses just for fun. So we're just scribbling on the colours. By the way, this is not a technique for those of you who want precise, exact things to happen. But I'll bet you do. All right. So I've got some things there that could end up as tulips or roses. Let's go tulips on one side, roses on the other. Tulip leaves are long blady things. I can do long lines. That's our thallo green. It's a standard, a standard pure pigment green. This lime that I'm using now is green, uh, sorry, yellow with a little bit of green in it. Always start with your lightest colour in your mixing vessel first and add your darker one a little at a time. Now roses don't have long blady leaves, they have little scribbly leaves, so we'll do some little scribbly leaves. Notice, again, I am not filling up this fabric with colour. I'm thinking about my one centimetre gaps that we talked about in our first session. And I've got two layers that I'm working with here, so it's likely that there's more time for that colour to move. Going back to our while there's moisture, there's movement rule. Okay, I've just put a little bit of sky behind my tulips. Leave it alone, Anne. And now, just a quick smudge to get those colours working. Gloves on, optional. We know it's non-toxic. I'm being a bit clever here and using the same fingers for my dark colours. Now a different colour for my green. Different finger for my greens. It's one for my blues, just get that moving. Doesn't matter if they smudge onto each other. This is a technique where the colours sort of, which is my green finger, that one. <laughs> the colours sort of wander around anyway, and that's the aim of it. That's a tiny little rose there. We'll call that a bud, hey? Okay. Now for the water soluble resist. One of the handiest things you're going to have around is craft paper. There's our daub of testing colour from yesterday session. Okay, water soluble. We're going to flop it down behind the nozzle. This has a very different sort of nozzle from the dispenser caps. We're going to start that flow in the tissue and if it's reluctant to flow, don't keep squeezing because you could blow the whole cap. What you need 
is a pin, poke it in, stir it around, pull it out at an angle and that will clear the clog. Righto, I'm going to draw tulips, but I can't draw. Don't tell anybody. What I'm going to draw here is a line that's about the thickness of the string, no longer, no thicker. And if I do a few little zigzaggy bits up there, that'll probably look a little bit like a tulip. In one of the embellished magazines a couple of a week years ago, I had an article called a drawing lesson for people who can't draw. If you can draw though, keep it simple. The more complicated, the more technical you try to be with this, the more that water soluble resist will spread and you will actually lose what you've been trying to create. So I'm just doing a little zigzaggy top on my tulips there. I'll do a few blady lines in a moment. Just remembering these are all unique products asked for by me for our purposes. There's a little one at the front, let's pop that in. And we better give the tulips some leaves to grow on. They're long blady things. There we go. bit unconfident with this, grab a pencil while you're chatting on the phone and just doodle. Now for the roses. Oh, we better give that one a stem because it doesn't have any leaf behind it. Nor does that one. Okay. Probably a little bit hard to see, but I think you can see how quickly I did all that. For the roses, I can't draw a rose either. So all I'm going to do is a little spirally thing and it'll come up looking just fine. And you see this sort of thing happening on the large piece on my display. This is a little bud, little fella. And rose leaves are little short fat stubby things so really any leaf is going to be three lines no matter what shape it is sort of on your simple leaves we're going to then leave this to dry And it will take a while and again it's fun watching paint dry because you'll see those colours meander around. They, the resist lines are, meant to, are not meant to hold the colour in. They're meant to let the colours be free to move and then the end result becomes quite amazing. I know I haven't turned my tulips and roses into gum blossoms but a gum blossom is just a an upside down tutu and the gum leaves are upside down um, tulip leaves. So how simple can this be? But do keep it simple. Okay so that one's gonna be fun to watch as it dries. When you cap these bottles screw the cap on as far as it will go because they're set up so that the fine pointy nozzle will sit against the inside of the cap and stop the uh, product from drying out. Sorry, it didn't look like it. Now, let's see what happens during the drying time. The original line will show as a clear line and then the resist spreads to either side of it. So that should be your end result, depending on the fineness of the design as to how the spread will happen. And it will happen differently on different fabrics too. So if you're getting a slightly different result, don't worry, because it's just the fabric and how you've done it. But I must emphasize that too much detail will just kill it. It just makes a blob and you'll think, uh-oh, try again, and you'll come up right. Okay. If you want to do a piece of fabric 
that has all four representations on it, you simply do a piece that's four times the size you need. So you can use the top of the top one, the bottom of your top one, the top of your bottom one, the bottom of your bottom one in one piece. And if it's finer fabric, gee, you might even try working through three layers and see what happens. That's for you for homework. Let's see what happens when we start playing with marbles. For starters, I'm going to use these little ordinary marbles, which come in an array of sizes. And then later on, we're going to progress to what I call my mega marbles. They're good fun. You're going to start looking for all sorts of things. Even the bottle caps make great things to use when you're designing like this. I haven't wet this piece of fabric yet, just in case you didn't catch up with session one. Okay, so we put our fabric, and normally we work on wet fabric, into the water, squeeze, squeeze, squeeze like mad until there are no drips coming out. Blot it in a towel if you need, but we certainly don't want the fabric feeling sloppy. Okay, nice and dry but not too dry. I'm just drying my hands now. When you're designing with marbles, the marble goes everywhere you want the focal point of your pattern to be. So I'll just pop that one in underneath, drape the fabric down around it, take a rubber band, and I am a quick and easy lazy person so I double it first. And go whack, whack, whack a couple of times. And we want the rubber band to be tight enough so that when you do this next step, you don't lose your marbles, but not so tight that you have to cut the blooming thing off when it's time to take the marbles out because you don't want to run the risk of snipping your fabric. So everywhere I want the part at center of my pattern to be, in goes a marble. We'll just do the one for this quick sample. Okay, lay it out. You've got your hills and valleys forming. In our first session, we were then able to use our diluted colors to um, draw onto our fabric, but we've sort of got a hop over all those little bumps when we're doing this. I'm going to do a flower. A flower garden and then we'll talk about a few variations. I like to start off with a flower center color on the marble, because that's going to be the center of my flower, just a couple of dabs while there's moisture, there's movement. That's going to keep traveling there through the damp fabric. My flower colors will then go around, and these are open, around the marble but not meeting up to it because we don't want to go into enemy territory, remembering that excess is the enemy. We don't want to make our fabric stiff, dull and ugly. Dab, 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 dab. Speed up a bit. And of course the bands of colour that you apply will depend on how big you want that flower to be or that particular shape if you're not doing flowers. Okay, flowers done. Now for the greenery. Dab, 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 dab. I don't mind a little bit of white in my garden. It gives you the light and shade. I can't go anywhere without a little bit of lime though. And when I'm doing flowers, my last little touch will be to add a bit of the flower color into the background just to tie it all together. And you'll see the end result of that in the little smudgy bits. They don't particularly look the color of the flower because they are actually blending with the greens. Just a little bit in. My bottles are actually open from my first session. But if you need to open them, that is because you've just mixed them up. Remember to grip the cap and turn the screwy bit as far as it will go. Okay.
I now look at that and think, okay, do I have enough colour on there? If my gaps are any bigger than about a centimetre, that is my little finger, I may need to add a little more. Especially in the heels, because the colour will travel down better than it will travel up. That's probably about time to leave that alone. Do I have excess in there? Let's feel it. Remembering we're always touching with the backs of our fingers. Yeah, that does feel a little bit sloppy. I'm going to get a piece of damp fabric to wipe that. Our all day mop up. So if it feels a bit sloppy, we've got to get moppy. Again, I'll use a piece of silk. Now this is a really clever one for you. If you put your mop-up piece, and it's got to be lightweight and absorbent, immediately over the marble and then cup your hands down over the marble, you will pick up perfect flowers. And then just let's finish that piece off with a quick dab, dab, dab of my fingertips. You know by now that I don't like wearing gloves. I haven't quite got that finished. Can't not finish it. But I'm holding up the flower so that it doesn't touch down and spoil it. We'll put that aside to dry. Now, believe it or not, that little piece of fabric is enough to make a little glasses case, a um, iPad, iPod cover, phone cover, whatever. Just need a second piece for the lining. And yes, I do have all the patterns for those bits and pieces that I'm showing you. Okay, one last thing when I'm doing my flower garden. I want to give it a bit of a leafy look and we know from our first samples on the se first session that what's up's going to go darker, what's down's going to go lighter. So if I just scrunch that, and it looks really ugly about now, <laughs> if I just scrunch that into little hills and valleys, whether it be cotton, polycotton, whatever fabric you're working on, silk, you'll get your darks and your lights and it'll look far more like a flower garden, especially if you've got more than one flower in it. Clean off the fingers. Pop that aside to dry. And we can look at a few variations on a theme. Think about river stones, think about the big marbles and getting bigger patterns, a variety of sizes in your work also looks great. Folks, this is where you're going to fall in love with your iron and your ironing board, truly. Getting that little knob out where the marble has been is probably the trickiest part of this one, but you can see from ugly comes yummy. And this is where it is really important to spray that with water before you iron it. We know that when liquid radiance is dry, it's stable. You can't move it. You can't remove it. Check those ideals from session one. Um, yep, so you can spray that quite happily and provided the colour is dry, it isn't going anywhere. To get these different patterns, it's a case of just applying the colours differently. And this is one of my favourites, which I call a Y with extra legs. So we draw a Y. Now, I've confessed I can't draw. Five petal flower could end up with four or six or heaven only knows how many. So if I draw my Y first and give it a couple of extra legs, if I were drawing a flower, I then have the ability to create five petals around that, and that's an absolutely fabulous trick. Oh, that's a bit whoopee. Um, a fabulous trick when you're doing your water-soluble work. With this one here, 
It just means that I can put on my colours relatively evenly and get a good result rather than having some really fat bits and really skinny bits. So my first colour would go on the marble and then where you see the straight lines and my second colour would go in between. And of course you've got to spread them out a little bit so that you fill that gap without filling it too much. Doing the blot up of course applies as well. Love my wire with extra legs, hope you do too. Something like this is what I call an abstract and that was simply blobs of colour around the marbles, just continuing that colour out until they meet up. So yes, and something like that if you want a starry pattern, instead of scrunching your fabric, you grab your marbles and pull them apart so you get these lovely strong lines between. So it's all a case of knowing how to handle the fabric to get your different effects. <laughs> Let's think about what happens with a reverse marble, sort of. This time we're looking at something that we can poke our fabric into. and get these sorts of floral patterns happening. There are two ways we can go about this. We can either poke our fabric first and then colour it around the bars, or we can colour it first and then poke it. I find colouring first and then poking it a lot easier, a lot quicker, but this one is a lot more precise where you poke first and then colour. So this is going to be a quick let's pretend. I think you can get the idea by now. Fabric goes across the grid and the fun bit is knowing how far you can poke without touching the bottom. Things like fingers, brush handles, saute sticks are going to do the job for you. You can poke every hole, you can poke every second hole. But the trick is not to pull out what you've done, so you start in the centre and work outwards. A brush handle would be a whole lot easier to work with, Anne, than your fingers. But I'm hoping you're getting the idea. And this is really light fabric too. Okay, so that'll go in, it'll stay there. It's not going to touch down onto your surface and a piece of fabric this size actually needs a grid a whole lot bigger than that. So that was a quick let's pretend. To colour, if you've poked first, you're actually putting the colour only on the grid and then letting it move down into the holes, into the dents. The patterning comes from how you've poked and the fabric will automatically squish itself around that grid and form the floral shapes. So let's open this one up and see what's happened. Yes, again, you're going to fall in love with your iron and your ironing board because you're exploring all these amazing patterns. Grids are fun. Let's bring in the big guns. See what you can find at the recycling shop at the tip. Bread crates are brilliant. Any sort of baskets that have got holes in them are going to be totally repurposed for your fabric design. Now you saw I struggled with this piece of damp fabric on that other piece. But look how easily that happens. The crate is grippy. There are all sorts of different patterns in these bread crates, by the way. And you can get some amazing patterns happening. I love things that make me look clever when I'm not really. All right. So that could either have been coloured first or just poked and then coloured. Um, there are many, many ways we can colour too, and I'm going to take you into those very shortly. All right, 
So start looking for plastic baskets, nursery crates, um, <laughs> bread crates. You'll be amazed what you'll have in your kitchen cupboards. Mm. And because everything's non-toxic, you don't have to worry about using your baking trays and just going back to cooking with them. Blotting up from something like that is tricky. So what we're going to use is a piece of dry fabric and lay it across the top because we obviously can't squeeze it out or blot it out in the normal way. And you can get some really interesting blot ups from that as well. Working with dry fabric or, or wet fabric. Okay. The last thing I'm going to play with using our little bottles of dilute colour is working on a pole. And this is the tip of a huge iceberg. <sighs> what can we do around poles? Stick around and I'll show you lots. Okay, what I've done to create the sort of patterns you see in front of me now are just randomly pieces of fabric around a drink bottle. Or it could be a fancy pole if you wanted, but everybody's got drink bottles, drink cans, no matter what size the bottle, not what size the can. If you overlap it, you're going to get a different pattern. The fabric is damp, just like you've seen before. And I'm using this time the wide rubber bands because that's going to give you the lovely stemmy look. And what you want is a really random pattern, so don't think too much too quick, too much seriously about how you actually put that on the bottle. Um, not thinking at all about the colours I'm going to use. We've got some red there. And of course you've got to go dot 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 with this one because you can't draw on it. Oops. Thinking moisture movement. Those colours will travel, so we're still thinking those centimetre gaps. It becomes a habit, guys. If you wanted to create some sort of a scene, you could do one colour at the bottom, another colour, then another colour around the pole rather than up and down the pole. It's one of my favourite greens. It's yellow with a little bit of black in it, and you get all those lovely olivey, avocado y colours. The next thing I'm going to need to do with this one is work those colours through the layers a bit because there's quite a bit of fabric chocked up in under there. So move over you guys. And I'm just going to use that my hands like a rolling pin there. And roll it across my fabric, across the board. A bit like playing the drums. bald patch. Let's fix that. I've got to remember while there's moisture there's movement so I don't want to put too much there. If you don't want to smudge your colours at this stage what you do is wrap it with plastic that you can see through or pop it in a plastic bag tightly and then do that within the plastic bag. Okay, that is done. Have I gone into enemy territory? Have I put too much in? We know that excess is going to make the fabric stiff and dull. Let's clean up that board a bit. Let's clean up me a bit. So this time I can lay out a piece of either wet or dry fabric. And this will be very similar to the um, uh, blotting up from the grid. And then just use your fabric like a rolling pin across that. Gosh, it's unusual. I pretty much got it right. And these make amazing backgrounds with stencils or prints or things on them. It's very light. Do I like it? Oh, I don't know. Nothing's ever finished until you leave it alone. So I can go back and do more on that later on. But this one is now finished.
Oh, when I need something in a hurry, of course. <laughs> My principle is um, if it stands still long enough, I'll spray it. So the bathers, the frock, the, yeah, anything, the shorts, anything. Just a case of mixing up your colours when they're ready to go. But we're going to practice with water first because I'm going to teach you to spray in such a way that you can do this in your dining room over cream carpet. You probably choose not to, but anyway, let's get you working so carefully and so precisely that you could. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're using commercial sprayers, water bottles and um, commercial trigger sprayers or our pistol sprayers. The pistol sprayers will fit the commercial bottles and the water bottles. Just you might have to cut them down sometimes to fit in the shorter bottles. Anyway, you've got your colours prepared and now we're going to practice with water first. I don't want a jet. Oh, that could be fun <laughs> for some designs. I don't want a mist that sort of goes everywhere because that's just going to make a mess. I better make sure I don't get my cameras here. Okay, so we don't want that. What we want, and this is what you're going to work towards, is a spray that's about the width of your hand when you're working the length of your hand away from the surface on which you're working. Whether you're working horizontally, as I am here, or vertically with your um, pieces hanging on a clothesline or in a tree or something. I've um, got to tell you, I've got the cleanest back wall, brick wall, in, in Toowoomba because that's where all my ladies who come to hands-on sessions practice, they're spraying. Okay, so let's get this trigger adjusted. You're going to find somewhere where you can spray, it might be a telephone pole or something, but you've got to be able to see the width of your spray, not a painted wall. Okay. That's getting there. And you can see I can spray that easily and evenly onto my fabric wherever I want it at whatever angle. I'm close to my fabric and my spray is the width of my hand. If I want a finer spray, I can adjust it to that. But, um, you know, you don't want it wider because then it's just going to spray the neighbourhood and um, things all around you and that's not what you want. Yes, you can see how easily that spraying. The other thing I need you to look for is a really firm trigger action with your sprayer so that you're getting that nice tss, tss, tss sound coming out of it, not funny little jiggle jiggle tss, 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 um, noises. Um, yeah, that's not what you want, that's when you'll have funny drops everywhere. Okay, when you're ready then to work with your colours, you simply get rid of the water I'll put it back in the bottle now, but normally I'd take it out and spray something in the garden. And then you're going to be putting a, a water-free trigger into your um, colour bottle and you're not going to have a first few squirts of colour out. Always handy though to have an old towel to throw down to give it the first few squirts when you're working with colour just in case there is a bit of water left in your, in your pipes. Alright, that's how easy it is to spray neatly, cleanly and without making a mess. Just always remember if you're making a mess with liquid radiance you're not doing it right. Thinking about the first session, when we talked about um, working with bottled water so that the, the colours, the purity of the colours don't go off with bacteria, I will normally just buy some bottled water in a nice strong bottle though, not those squishy ones. And I simply open the bottle, take a sip out, and add my colour to that. And because that water is bacteria free, unless I've put some in there, um, <laughs> that's going to last and last and last. But 
liquid radiance can get some gucky bits in it over time. Here are some that have been made up for ages. I'll show you how to make up one of these in a moment. And you can see the sort of lumpy bits in there. Uh, but it doesn't send the product off. It just needs a piece of stocking across the top to strain out any gucky bits. Okay, so let's make up some colours. This time I'm not going to work with a one quarter concentrate, three quarters. Water. The hardest part of this is getting that jolly cap open. I'm going to make up about a 1 in 15 mix with this and you'll very quickly discover that my mixtures are very ish. The key is having some craft paper so you can check your colours out. Out comes a mouthful of water and this time I'm putting in the concentrate. Look, no stocking. I want to make up an orange here because there's a point in my doing that. To measure my bottle, I'm going to put about a half a bottle of liquid radiance concentrate into that 250ml bottle of water. Well, it's probably a little bit like 240 now. That doesn't matter. When I measure a bottle, I see half a bottle as being thumb deep. So no matter where the level of the concentrate is in that bottle, I plant my thumb, one thumb deep, and I simply open up the dispenser cap and squeeze till I get down to that mark. Now I'm not going to need quite half a bottle because I want to make orange and I want to put some red in that. Nearly there. It seems like a lot of colour to make up. You don't have to make up a whole bottle if you don't want to. But out of this I can get up to 10 pairs of socks. Okay, some red concentrate. If I put magenta into yellow, I'll get burnt orange. If I put red into it, I'll get clear orange. Now that bottle is well down. So if I was measuring a half bottle from there, it'd be almost all of it. I just need a little bit though to turn my red into orange. My yellow into orange and red. Here's the interesting bit when you're mixing with your colours. Always start with the lightest colour in your vessel, whatever that vessel is going to be first, and add your second one to it a little at a time. What you see in the bottle on yellow based colours will be significantly stronger than what you'll see on your fabric. It's interesting. So the craft paper test is vital when you're doing something like this. You can see how accurately I'm not measuring this. But by having that daub on your paper you can then eye match any further batches that you wanted to make. Okay, easy. And it would be a similar situation with my big bottle of water. What will I make up in here? I'll make up a magenta. I'm going to make up a lighter mix in this. It'll be about a 1 in 30. Normally I would say 300 mils of water with about a third of a bottle of liquid radiance concentrate. But I've got 600 mils or close to in there, so I'll need two thirds of a bottle of concentrate. Now where a half is a thumb on your bottle, a third is a thumb on its side, my thumb on its side on a bottle. Our thumbs are pretty much the same, so it's not a bad way of measuring. If you think about it, of course you can use a ruler. But then that doesn't take into account where the product actually ends up or starts off in the bottle. So I know that the product is there, I've got a tip to about there. After a while you get good at this and you just know how long that squirt needs to be or you use your craft paper test. Colour is mixed. Check it out. Do I need it a little stronger? I put more concentrate on. 
Do I need a little weaker? No, start off on the weaker side and add more to it because if you start adding water to that you could end up with a 44 gallon drum full more than you need. Now the important thing then is to take off that little um, ring that holds the um, lid together when you buy it so that you'll notice the bottles that I'm using here all have that ring removed. It just helps the spray cap the pistol sprayer fit on better. So I've got colours mixed up at various intensities and I can use them for colouring whatever I want. The shirt I'm wearing uh, was a 1 in 20, this sort of intensity mix with black and it was an ugly, ugly grey thing, blob, when I coloured it. It took about 200 mils to colour, of prepared colour, to colour this shirt. Squeeze out the excess, lay it out on the board, scrunch it up, get my hills and valleys that make my darks and lights. It depends on what sort of a look you want, as to whether you're going to dunk it or spray it. And... Um, Yes, that's the hardest part, deciding. We do have a Garments Galore handbook which is going to help you through some of this. What I'm going to use now is these little bottles that I have here in the um, Stronger Mix. And we're going to work on a bigger project. Move the sprayers because I don't need them at the moment. And heliography got a very brief mention in our first session, so let's explore that one a little bit further now. These are bags, or I could be using folded fabric. I have pre-wet a bag. Folding boards are really handy for keeping things damp. Get that nice and flat. I'm going to use these very similarly to the dispenser bottles but we've got to remember that these are going to flow so much faster. Now I know by the name on that bottle that this first colour I'm going to put on, it's a, a red brown mix, um, has been made up, oh gosh, for about 18 months. You can see how quickly that flows. It does have some gloopy bits in it. I should have used a stocking, but I can rub those in and nobody will know. I've got to tell you, the colour even has a funny smell to it. That doesn't affect the product adversely at all. Truly, you can't kill this stuff. So those colours are a lot paler than we'd, we've been using so far and I guess you'd expect that because we're using a lot more water in them. Have I gone into enemy territory? I don't know. I'll find out in a moment. I don't think so, but let's go. Five finger foam brush. This time becomes a full fist foam brush or we can roll and make it a much simpler job. Just be careful where your hands are going. You don't want to travel colours into the others. Mess them up. Okay, rub out those gucky bits. Get those blended across. Great way to colour a large piece of striped fabric. And we've got the handles done as well, which you wouldn't have on your striped fabric, but I do have on my bag. My next step for this one, I'll get that nice and flat, will be to decide what to do with it. If it felt a little sloppy, I would simply pop another piece of dry fabric over the top, blot it up and have another piece of fabric ready coloured for whatever I wanted to use it for. Okay, 
So all the rules apply no matter what you're doing. I'm going to keep that nice and damp until after this session is finished and then I will do something with it. What I will do, if the sun is cooperating outside, is lay it on a bread crate. See the check pattern in the back from the grid. That was on a different shape bread, bread crate. And put plastic lace across the top, keeping it nice and flat so you get that really good imprint. What happens when you put these things out in the sun is that what's under the object will go lighter or what's around the object is going to go darker. So the colours that you saw as fairly weak on the bag that I've just coloured will be incredibly stronger at the end of the process. Do we dry everything in the sun? Absolutely no. We dry heliography, sun printing in the sun. Um, drying things naturally inside allows the colours to develop in the layers and that's what we need in a lot of the techniques that we've been working with so far. So I am not going to hasten the drying time of things by putting them in the sun in that that is going to not allow the beauty of the colours to do their thing. I'll bet you can see that this one wasn't laid flat on the bread crate, it was poked in. And you get that different patterning on the back. A bigger hole in the bread crate. I'm just going to do a quick sample of spray painting so you can see really how quickly it happens. Um, you get a very different look from working with a marble when you're working with these mega marbles. On my small piece of fabric here I've had to use ping pong balls because these would have been just way too big but if you're working on bed sheets, quilt backs, these huge toys um, you can buy a hundred of them for next to nothing. Various shops are just a great way of getting an amazing florally starry looking pattern. Okay I'm going to move that one. We'll undo that in a moment. I like to have an old towel beside me so I can actually check the colours and these have been started. That one needs a bit of a help. That's better. Remember I'm looking for my hand width. Now I thought I'd show you the difference between cyan and blue because we looked at them in the bottle and they looked almost the same. But when you see them In action, they are very different. The top one is blue, the bottom one is cyan. Cyan so printers colour that lovely sea blue colour. Okay, so I am working with yellow. We know it needs friends to be visible. So we've got some blue and some, some cyan and some green. And I'm losing my marbles here. Okay, here we go. hands width away from my fabric in nice and close. Let's give that yellow some friends. And that's a dilution of 1 in 30 and it's still really good strong colour. You could work on this fabric dry. I have it damp. Under that marble it would be handy if I twisted this around or if I was walking around my table but not quite possible. So how quick would it be to whip up a shirt with just a few squirts like that? It is a little bit sloppy. Let's get moppy. There is absolutely no spray on my towel around that and that's why it's okay to work on your dining room table over cream carpet, but don't. While there's moisture, there's movement, those colours, colours are going to keep working while they dry, but we'll dry that inside. Really important, 
after you've finished a spraying session to clean these sprayers as quickly as you can. Job number one is to get what's in the sprayer back into the bottle and then you take that to your laundry sink, pop it under water and spray, spray, spray till no colour comes out. Um, we've got to remember that liquid radiance is a paint and a paint will form a skin. So if we have the skin staying in the, the sprayers, they're not going to work again. Um, another perfect aid for cleaning things up is an old toothbrush. Never use anything metallic to scrub these things. I'll pop that back in there and I'll clean those up as soon as this session is over. Now I will tell you that these colours have been made up for months. There is no smell in there whatsoever. There is no glugginess. They've got to survive summer yet. They might get a bit of mould in them but that doesn't worry me at all. I know that they can be strained and still usable. You cannot kill liquid radiance. But you can clean, but you can kill the fabric you're putting it into if you put too much in. Remember, excess is your enemy. So here we've got this funny little bit of fabric that's now dry. The marbles come out. There'll be a lot more fabric colour here because and white in this case because the marbles make a much bigger area of enclosure and we have our pattern with the three primaries and our ironing board is going to be fun don't remember don't forget we're going to do the spray stretch and iron Colours are dry then, not going anywhere. Spray them with water, dunk them in water if you want to, and then spray them out and iron them. Half a minute for strong colour, up to two minutes for pale colour. Done. For our last little play on session number two, we're going to do a pair of socks, but it could be a shirt, it could be a t-shirt, it could be the sort of shirt I'm wearing, it could be a hat, it could be anything that's fabric. Job number one, we're going to wet the pair of socks. Now, because of the elastane in these socks, it's a bit hard for the water to get through them at times, so squeeze, squeeze, squeeze till all the bubbles come out. And I'm just going to wring those out really, really thoroughly. Plan B would be to blot them in a towel. But I sort of reckon plan A works just fine. We'll get all the drips out of that. Now we need another plastic dish or something that we can put the colour into. And I'm sure you'll have a laundry scoop or a medicine glass or something that you can then use to measure your colour into your chosen vessel. I know that it takes around about 40 to 60 mils, depending on the fibre of the sock, to colour a pair of socks. Uh, 250 to 300 mils to do an adult t-shirt, a lot less for a kid's t-shirt. And I've got all these um, measurements in my um, handbooks, the Garments Galore one and in the uh, Fabulous Fabrics as well. So there's lots of information there, or you can yell and ask me. Okay, I have got a vessel, I have got a 30-ish mil measure, and I then have to decide what color I want to do my socks. And what strength? I'm going to go for a pair of orange socks. I'll use the colors I've just made up in the one in 20 mix-ish. Fill it up to the top. These have got a fairly thick top on them so I might just err on the side of a little bit too much because I know I can use that up for something else later. Oops, come back here. 
If you clean this up as you go, it's going to be a whole lot easier to clean up at the end. Dry it out. Now, this is where I'm actually going to be a little bit good when I'm doing bigger objects. I do wear a pair of disposable gloves. Don't wear gloves that are flappy. If you've got kids doing this, um, don't let them wear gloves because any flappy bits on the end of the gloves are just going to put colour everywhere. So, soap and water and a nail brush, brush, they'll come clean. Have a pack of baby washcloths, wet ones, beside you while you're working and they can wipe their hands on those as they go. And then a towel. Okay, socks. We're going to put both socks in together. And squish that through the prepared colour. And in no time flat, it's all gone. And you think, oh no, what's going on here? Well, it's all in the socks, isn't it? So we squeeze it out. And we dunk it back in. Just like we did the spiral in session one. And we squeeze it out. And we dunk it back in. And we squeeze it out. The key of this is don't do one sock and then the other sock because the moisture that comes out of one sock is going to lighten, out of the first sock, is going to lighten the second sock. So we need to do them both together to a point where they're pretty evenly coloured. Then we can put one on plastic. We don't want the towel to pinch all that lovely colour. Just check that sock number one is okay. Squeeze out the excess. Done. Ditto. Check how it is. Squeeze out the excess. The enemy is now in my dish and it's a much paler colour than it all started off. Dry off my gloves. Put that aside. We're going to use that for something shortly. And now I've got to decide what I'm going to put my socks on. I'm going to use these fancy bottles. But it could be drink bottles, it could be drink cans. We don't laugh. We have even worked on two litre milk bottles. And yes, they do fit with a bit of a squeeze. Fortunately, they were big socks. If I'm working on a bottle, the other thing I need is an egg carton. And egg cartons come in all shapes and sizes too. And there's always somewhere that you can fit a bottle. Sometimes it's with lid on, sometimes with lid off. Figure out where you... Uh, bottle will fit and you're ready to work. These socks are a much paler colour at the moment. We've got to remember that liquid radiance dries darker. You see. We're simply going to dress our drink bottle, our, our whatever round object, with the sock. Sometimes a rubber band will help just secure it onto the end of the bottle. And what we're going to look for in this sock is the smiley face. Did you know your socks have a smiley face? Mouth, two eyes. Did you know your socks had a smiley face? And it's important because smiley faces on socks are just like Smiley faces on people. Smiley face on one side, heels on the other side. We need to know where the heel of our sock is. Here we go. I'm making uppy downy bits just by bringing that sock up the bottle. What's exposed to the air is going to go dark, what's enclosed is going to be lighter. And here is my heel. Smiley face heel on the opposite side. I don't want that heel flopping over and spoiling the pattern of my sock. So all I'm going to do is tuck that in like little old man without his false teeth in. One's done. One to go. Notice that I've put that sock aside because if I try to leave it in while I do the second one, it's just going to flop around. I'll just whip this one up quickly. 
smiley face, dirt, dirt, heel will be on that side, rubber band to hold it in place. Sometimes you're lucky and there's a um, groove in your drink bottle that just holds that rubber band in perfectly. On the drink cups, it's got a groove and you've got to sit the band in the groove, otherwise they just f come flying off. Check that the band of the sock is nice and straight and not tucked under. Look for my heel. Rubber band pinged off. <laughs> That's all right. Now I can check, actually they hold, hold quite firmly so it doesn't really need it there. I can check that they are around about the same length by putting them together on the egg carton. But don't dry them together because the air can't get it. The middle, separate them, socks done. If it's absorbent, it can be coloured. Salted the bra haven't salted the socks, can you do a pair of socks and sold them? Absolutely. What I want you to start thinking about and continue thinking about is that there are colouring methods and there are handling methods. Sometimes it's one colour colouring, sometimes it's multicolour colouring. Um, on my um, YouTube notes there will be a method of colouring your socks that are multicoloured. We'll talk about a different way in a moment as well. But so yeah, just just dive into the extra um, resources that I have for you to help you be successful with all of this stuff. Okay, we've talked about ironing our fabrics. Do we have to iron our socks? Yep, once. Okay. When you're colouring things that have elastane in them, like socks, undies, when you're colouring things that are delicate like laces and lingerie. You don't always want to put a hot iron on them but let's do the socks first. When you're doing things with elastane in them the colour will adhere to the fibre but it won't adhere to the rubber component. I mean that's a coarse way of putting it, I know, but it is a rubbery component that gives them its elasticity. Okay, so what I discovered was when I would iron the socks the way I would fold them with the heel down, I would get a stress line and I would get, after washing, 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 uh, a light patch down there. I've now discovered that if I've iron the socks with the heels under like that, flatten them out that way. If there are any stress lines occurring it's down the side not on the top of your foot where it looks a bit weird. So we're going to iron our socks once, that way, that way, flip them over, iron, iron, remembering that the iron ironing is de-stressing the fibre, yes they are a bit stiff at the moment, if they're still stiff after you've ironed them, that's you, you've put too much colour in. Um, so it, they come back to the softness of the fibre. But it also maximises the life of the colour through washability uh, for light fastness and colour fastness. Okay, so yes we are going to iron our socks once, remembering to th flatten them up with the heel underneath, not side on. Can you wash your red socks with your white undies? Yep. Even though a little colour may come out from the elastane content, it's not going to be active colour. When liquid radiance is dry, you can't move it, you can't remove it, and you can't reactivate it, unlike dyes. So once you might get a little bit of pinkness or whatever colour in your wash. It is not going to adhere to any other fibre. Yep, no worries washing your red socks with your white singlets. <laughs> so, no worries there. Okay, when you've got more delicate items that you need to heat set, ironing these is probably not a good idea. So what we do with these is just use a hairdryer up close to get that heating component into it, liquid radiance is a heat set product. Um, even though when it's dry, it's stable, you can't get it out, not even bleach will get it out. Um, the heating will help the 
product bond to the fibres in whatever fabric you're using. So a hair dryer up close. I don't subscribe to the tumble dryer thing because you can't control the time, but if you want to try that, fine. Um, never iron from wet to dry because the colour is all going to come out to your ironing board. So lots and lots and lots of little aspects of liquid radiance and what we do with it have happened in today's session. Uh, our next couple of sessions are going to be involved in my passion, well everything is really, but silk painting which is where it all started for me and then we'll move into some other bits and pieces just to show you how different we are with Genesis Creations, liquid radiance and our other goodies. So stick with me guys and um, let's continue the journey together. Thank you.